Uh, good evening and thank you for joining us for the Reed Union School District Governing Board Candidate Forum, which is being live streamed on YouTube. My name is Emily Lavin and I am the education reporter at the ARC newspaper. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters of Marin County for moderating tonight's event. Uh, this year, the League of Women Voters has been celebrating 100 years of following a mission to empower voters and defend democracy. Moderating candidate forums is an important part of the, their vision of a democracy where every citizen has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. The League is a strictly nonpartisan organization and never supports or opposes individual candidates or particular parties, political parties. Uh, we encourage our audience to submit their questions to reunion at marinlwf.org. Um, and with that, I will hand things over to our moderator, uh, League member Susan Stomp. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I'm Susan Stomp, a member of the League of Women Voters of Marin County and your moderator for tonight's forum. The Marin Community Mer Media Center of Marin is off screen providing technical support. Thank you for joining us tonight for this forum featuring candidates for the Reed Union School District Governing Board. Thank you to the ARC newspaper for inviting the League to moderate this event. We're honored to be here. Slide one, please. With me are League members, Linda Sula as timekeeper, Jill Sampson and Greg Brockbank as question sorters and Nancy Bell and uh, Ann Wakely for Zoom support. The YouTube live stream of tonight's forum is made possible with the support of our media partner, Community Media Center of Marin. Thank you. The League uh, is a membership uh, organization that encourages informed and active participation in government we do not endorse or oppose candidates or political parties. In addition to promoting uh, voter education, the League does participate in advocacy for issues they may have uh, taken positions on uh, that arise as ballot measures. I would like to require everyone uh, to remind everyone that the candidates have agreed to participate under the ground rules of uh, the League Forum. In order to ensure that impartiality is maintained, it's the League's policy that candidate forum members and the live um, voting uh, do not live in the voting jurisdiction of the candidates, nor can they actively be involved in supporting any candidate campaign. Before we get started, there's some details to a review that will uh, help to keep you uh, with in, involved in the session. Tonight's forum is being live streamed on the League's YouTube channel. The viewing public is invited to submit questions uh, to the email address that's displayed at the bottom of the screen. It's uh, Read union at marinlwv.org. Through our partnership with the Community Media Center of Marin, this forum is being recorded and will be posted on our website at www.marinlwv.org. For broader community uh, access, a gavel to gavel production will be rebroadcast on CMCMTV channel 30. The days and times will be on the league website. I would like to briefly explain the roles of the timekeeper and the question sorters. To assure everyone stays within the allotted time, you will see a box designated clock at the appropriate time, the box will turn yellow for approximately 30 seconds, for 10 seconds, uh, indicating that the candidates have 30 seconds remaining for their response. The box will then go black, and when the box turns red, the candidate should complete the, the sentence that they're on at the time. You may submit, you, the public, may submit questions to the email address displayed on the screen, readunion at 
morinlwv.org anytime during the forum. Our question sorters are on standby to review incoming questions. I want to assure you that the question sorters do not censure questions, but rather they screen the questions for duplication and anything that is inappropriate. If you do not recognize your question, uh, it may have been combined with other questions on the same topic. Slide two, please. There are four candidates running for two seats on the Reed Union School District Governing Board. The candidates tonight are Dan Emerson, Charles Hornbrook, Jacqueline Jaffe, Liz Edison Webb. Thank you. The candidates have been invited to make a two minute opening statement after uh, all the candidates have had uh, their opportunity to make their opening statement, we'll get into questions. So the questions will have, they'll have 90 seconds to answer each question and each candidate will answer all of the questions. To be fair, I will rotate the order in which they respond to the questions. For opening statements now, we'll begin with Dan Emerson. Dan? Unmute yourself and carry on. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dan Emerson. You know, I'd like to thank uh, the League of Women Voters and the ARC for hosting this and the three other candidates for being a part of it. I think that's a great part of this process to be able to share the time with them and answer these questions. But um, I guess I got to talk about myself now. So I have a Bachelor's of Arts in Education as my undergrad. I got my Master's in Education as well in Administration. Uh, I've worked in the university level as an administrator and, and other duties for going on like 18 years, it seems like now. Uh, but I am new to the community. Uh, this is my opportunity to, you know, I've been here maybe three years going on four to try to help out. You know, I think uh, my experience as a former teacher, I'm a certified teacher in other states. So technically I could go and teach if I wanted to. Uh, and my work at state and private schools, you know, really gives me an opportunity to help and be a part of the process to continue to grow our wonderful school district that I think we have. You know, I'm hoping to bring some more diversity to the group as well, being a minority and having the ability to have our board reflect our community better and be more diverse, I think is a great opportunity. Uh, why I chose to step in and, and hopefully be able to help out and be a part of this community in a greater way and give back to all those that have helped me get to where I'm at and then help my, my kids and all the kids in the community. And lastly, you know, hopefully I can help ensure that, you know, the taxpayer dollars that are used that we're great stewards of that and the wonderful foundation that raises $2 million a year, that's amazing. I've never been in a school district that has such a wonderful foundation that does that. And making sure that that money is also, we're great stewards of that, and that is spent wisely to make sure that it goes back to its purpose, which is to help all students in this community, all kids in this community get a great education. That, I mean, it's, it's better than private schools where I've been from. So that's my hope, and I hope that uh, you consider me. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Next speaker is Charles. Thanks, and uh, again, thank you again to the ARC, to the League of Women Voters, and also to the fellow candidates that are part of this. Uh, my wife, Lisa, and I, and our son uh, moved to Tiburon. He's a 11-year-old sixth grader at Del Mar. Uh, before that, we spent, or I spent about 20 years in San Francisco. Uh, we're actually part of the San Francisco Unified School District. Uh, for a time, I was actually part of an advisory committee to the San Francisco School District Board uh, that I was appointed to, to help manage a budget of $30 million uh, annually uh, for uh, education and enrichment. So arts, science, uh, athletics. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the, we chose to look for a different school district uh, for fit our needs and Tiburon and the region of school district exactly what we were looking for. When we moved here, it allowed me to get involved with different uh, efforts including uh, being an advocate for some trail uh, access um, here in the Marin Headlands. Uh, it allowed me to be appointed to the Tiburon uh, Parks Open Space and Trails Commission, in which I'm now vice chairman of that commission that I was appointed to by the Tiburon uh, Town Council. And it allowed me to get engaged a lot with uh, our son's ath uh, athletics. So I've been a head coach for soccer for three years now uh, and basketball for two, and hopefully it'll be three. We'll see what happens in the winter. Uh, hopefully we'll solve some of these issues. Uh, and it's also now that my time has been freed up, I've been able to get more involved 
with the school communities, uh, both volunteering with the PTA, on the administration, um, as well as helping out with Math Club. Uh, the reason I'm running, um, and I'm glad uh, Dan hit on diversity, is that there is a diversity of just different perspectives and what we're bringing to the school districts. Uh, having worked at a different district uh, and having that perspective, the pandemic has uh, brought some wrinkles to and some challenges to us. We have a great teachers, we have great parents, we have a great administration, but what we need to do is a little bit more diversity and some hard thinking uh, and hard decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, the next speaker is Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and to the ARC and to my fellow candidates. My husband and I have been part of Reed Union School District since our oldest started kindergarten in 2012. I have an eighth grader at Del Mar, a fifth grader at Bel Air, and a second grader at Reed. For the past eight years, I have volunteered in various roles for the Parent Teacher Association and the Foundation for Reed Schools. I sold Spiritware, co-chaired the Reed Regatta auction, spearheaded Towntastic, served as Bel Air site chair, served hot lunch, co-president for the foundation, and any other volunteer role where I could best serve this community. I am a product of California public education, having grown up in Orange County. I come from a family of public educators, where I learned the value of continuous improvement, of being better tomorrow than we are today. I am an attorney and work as executive director of Adopt a Family of Marin, where we support low-income families in the county. In 2017, I co-founded All In, a nonprofit and program of Adopt a Family of Marin, supporting low-income families in RUSD. All In, with your help, has supported Thanksgiving meals, back-to-school shoe campaigns, summer camp. This year, our summer camp funding was redirected, and we funded food cards for our low-income families. I am running because I have always been invested in our schools and community. While COVID has brought an unprecedented challenge to this district, it is not the first challenging conversation we have had, and it certainly will not be our last. I believe in communication and understand the fact that we all want to cross the finish line as one community. As an RUSD board member, I will prioritize equity and inclusion in our schools. I will work to increase trust and community investment. I will continue to create awareness and support so to level the playing field. It has been a challenging year, and we're lucky to have a wealth of resources in our district. Our families are an asset to RUSD, and I would be very honored to represent you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Next is Liz. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you. I too want to thank the League of Women Voters and the ARC for hosting this panel and my fellow candidates for the Reed Union School Board. I am running to retain my seat as the incumbent on the Reed Union Board of Trustees. I joined the school board because I deeply care about our schools and I want to support the outstanding education that RUSD provides. My husband and I both attended public elementary and we feel so fortunate to have received an outstanding public school education. We've been in the district for eight years and we have three children, uh, one at each of the schools, Reed, Bel Air and Del Mar. And I wanna do everything I can to help support our public schools and keep them strong and thriving. I have a background in research and data analytics, and I'm also a small business owner. I started a company 15 years ago focused on digital marketing strategy, and I focus on consumer research. I, as part of this role, I understand the importance of carefully listening to our key stakeholders and working as a team to provide accurate and data-driven solutions. I know this is a very tenuous time for our community, and I know this personally and deeply just because I have been navigating the COVID-19 pandemic as a board member for the past eight months. We have been working through ever-changing health and safety guidelines, and we do need to, and we have needed to adjust our educational systems to meet the needs of all of our students. I believe that now more than ever, we need stability, adaptability, and collaboration in our district. We need to safely reopen our schools and we need to prioritize the academic quality and rigor that we had prior to COVID-19. We also need to focus on equity and inclusion and provide continuity of learning for all of our students. I do feel a tremendous responsibility to our district and to our students and to make prudent decisions for our district. So I'm hopeful that you will elect me to help serve for another four years on the board. Thank you. Uh, now we'll get into the questions or the, yeah, the questions and we'll start with Charles. And the first question is, as it stands now, the district will be bringing students back to the campus part-time on October 5th and is targeting a mid-November date to have students attending in person. 
in-person classes five days a week. Do you support a full return to in-person school amid the pandemic? And how can the district balance a desire to have students back in class with continued concerns about the spread of the virus within the community? Great, thanks Susan for the question. Uh, and yeah, that is the uh, crux of the matter. There's, with students, there's a range of needs from wanting to get the kids back uh, to parents who want their kids to stay isolated. There's also a range of different risks uh, involved with that. Um, I do support them going back. It's actually the schools will start face-to-face -face on October 6th, which is a Tuesday. Um, and then after five weeks, uh, they'll be returning uh, quickly. I do support that. And I think it's been a challenge for the school district to find that balance. Because as we found, there's actually some parents who don't want their kids to go back to school now, even though they thought that maybe going back early would have been the solution. So what I think would we as a board, and we should be asking these harder questions, is how can we build flexibility using technology and help bring better solutions for all of the parents and all the- You're, you've been muted. Um, don't know how that happened. Um, Nancy, uh, the, uh, the, the Charles is on mute. Okay. What? Okay. I don't know what happened there. I'm back. Okay. We'll give you an extra few seconds. Well, okay. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> oh, so, so um, uh, coming back to school. So there's been a range of student needs and I think find using technology to help address those different needs for the students and for their different risks and creating that flexibility. We should have been doing that a little bit earlier and thinking about that. It is very hard. I think Liz hit on that very well is that this, is there ever changing things? And I think that's what we need to do in, in terms of moving forward. So yes, coming back on October 6th and yes, coming back soon after five weeks. Thanks. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Uh, my husband and I are both essential workers. So we have been navigating this in our own home since, um, since March. Um, and navigating these risks and um, truly the impossible. Right now we need to lean on what we know, which are the guidelines being offered by Marin Health and Human Services and the explanations being given by Drs. Willis and Santora. Um, as a mother of three students, I want my kids back more than anything. As executive director of Adoptive Family of Marin, I understand the need um, to get back to get these kids back on campus. Uh, COVID has absolutely highlighted inequities in education and we need to navigate our way back safely. I support the return to campus. Um, the only way to safely and effectively navigate that return is through what we do know, which are our county guidelines. Um, the school district is doing just that in offering multiple paths to return. Um, so that families can find what is appropriate for them. Thank you. Uh, next is Liz. Thank you. Yes, I too agree with my fellow candidates that we need to address safely reopening our schools. I very much empathize with the concerns that many of members of our community have. We've heard them speak up at board meetings. And it is it is a time where we need to navigate uncertain conditions, but we do need to rely on Marin Public Health and the guidelines that have been set forth for us. We very much need to support our educators and our staff to successfully implement those health and safety protocols that our schools have created. And we have implemented a number of guidelines with our reopening school safety plans, our site protection plans, all having been approved by Marin Public Health. And so we just need to take that step. I know that it's it's challenging. We have many different paths to begin. We started with a phased approach. Our phase two hybrid, which does start on Tuesday, that actually is a split cohort. So we have smaller size classes going into the classroom to really be able to ensure we can follow those safety protocols and get our students on campus. So I fully support reopening schools. I also did vote to support the second phase two opening on November 9th. And that gives us time to prepare and go to phase three. Thank you, uh, Dan. Yeah, I think, you know, that's a great question. It's kind of awkward in the sense, do you, it's not do you support, it's like, how can we do it the right way? You know, I don't think it's a question of 
we all know everyone wants their kids back in school. I'm dealing with this at the university level where we're managing, you know, how many are lying back and how we're doing that as well. But, you know, like Liz said, the board did a great job of, you know, taking the information they had and implementing a plan that was, you know, optional in terms of options for those that want to be in the class, those that aren't feel safe or ready to go back yet, while still addressing the needs of staff and students on all ends of it to make sure that we can do it safely. I mean, that's the ultimate goal, you know, is to be able to go back in a safe environment where everyone feels okay being in the classroom teaching so they can have that experience. Because when you look at some of the other places, you know, the rush to go back is also not a great thing. You know, I looked at one model where, you know, if you look at those 10 foot long tables, there's two students sitting on it, opposite ends. And then the next one's five feet, six feet, eight feet away from them, and you see their back. So I think the way they approached it was great. I think that's how we should, I, mean, I think any of us would approach it the same way is make sure that we take the information we have, make sure you come up with the best plan possible and then have options for those. So that way everyone in the community feels comfortable with how it's being implemented. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be answered by Jacqueline first. Uh, about 80% of the Reed Union School District student body identifies as white. What steps can the district take to ensure students of color are represented and supported on campus? And what steps, if any, should the district take to educate its staff and student body on implicit bias and systemic racism? Thank you. So this is something that we've been working on um, and the reason truly why All In was started in 2017. So um, All In and Adopt a Family has taught me about diversity and inequalities that exist in our communities. It's important for the board to ensure that we have policies that are cognizant of those diversities and that they support inclusion in our schools. Um, what we are currently navigating has highlighted these inequities. Uh, we have communities um, in our school district who have um, no access to Wi-Fi, uh, who come to school uh, hungry, um, who, um, you know, we need to create an awareness. And a lot of this starts with creating awareness and making sure our community knows that there are um, neighbors that need our help and support and then identifying how we help and what those areas are and then bringing those policies in and supporting them, whether it's through hotspots, whether it's through education, um, but it is um, our obligation morally and ethically as a board member to ensure that those policies are in place. Thank you. Liz, you're next. Uh, need to unmute. Thank there you. So we as a district are committed to ensuring diversity and inclusion within our schools. It's built into our long-term strategic plan where we focus on personal development to focus on implementing best practices in equity and inclusion that not only benefit our students, but also our staff and families. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has not only widened the divide between students with differing needs and backgrounds, but it's also given rise to new inequities in technology and socioeconomic inequities, distance learning versus in-person learning, so many areas where we can't focus on our strategic plan and get moving forward with bringing all of these topics to our students and bring them to the forefront. And so we've built in uh, principles of equity and inclusion in the continuity of education, education plan, which we passed in August. And it's really designed to ensure that Reed School District will create and sustain an inclusive and equitable and respectful environment, no matter where the learning is happening. Of course, we still have a long way to go, especially with what's been in the news and what we're hearing every day. Our students need to understand from their teachers how to talk about these issues. And they have been integrated in the distance learning, but we need to continue to keep those at the forefront of the conversation so that students can bring those topics home to the dinner table and that families can talk about them you know, outside and, and in the home. Thank you, Liz. Next is Dan. Oh, you guys are firing all cylinders. Uh, it's, a, it's another great question. I mean, the diversity and inclusion thing is a very big topic, you know, let's be honest. But I think where it really starts is you have to start at the top. You know, you got to make sure that your board is diverse, because if it's not diverse, how are they going to understand someone not from a, a lower socioeconomic status, someone, a person of color, someone from uh, another race, um, if it be race, religion, or other background to be able to talk about that. So it starts there by bringing those people to the table 
allow them to be part of that conversation. And then that trickles down to from the board, you're looking at uh, administrators and staff within the school that can help bring those same conversations within that group. And obviously there's a tons of ways to you know, educate them if it be workshops, speakers, and, and different other modules that you can have to help educate them on that process and the history behind a lot of those things when it comes to systemic racism and, and whatnot. And then taking that down to the next step within, uh, now the staff is educated, they can help return that back to the students. And part of that has to be having that conversation at home as well understanding that, you know, everyone's, you know, coming from a different place and having that open and honest conversation, you know, being a minority, we have that conversation all the time in my house with my kids. And so spreading that out is the big thing. It's easy to put it in a policy or have a policy on it, but then it's acting on it. The biggest thing that I've seen that's different is making sure that everyone's at the table when acting that in policy, because there's things that if you don't have a diverse group to talk about that, that's really not inclusion. Cause when you're hoping for inclusion, you're hoping for fairness. And in fairness, that means that you're looking at everyone and all the optional point of views that potentially could be impacted by the decision or policy you make. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Charles, you're next. Yeah, great. Um, thanks for the question. Um, so first, we have a great faculty who has spent a lot of time, as well as uh, points that Liz brought up that the board has put these things into the strategic plan. There are the, the, the faculty is ready to go and jump on all these pieces, which is fantastic. I think we have a great faculty and prepared to do that. But what we need to do is have from the board is always have an agenda item and making sure that we're addressing these pieces because the tone comes from the top. So it's the message from the top. And then the next piece is, is making sure that the faculty, it represents a, a diversity that we want to be targeting, which means making sure that we're using best practices to bring in a diverse group of faculty to make other folks comfortable about the schools that they're attending so that they're like, oh, there's teachers here that look like me. This is awesome. This makes me feel good as a student. And that's one of the things that we needed to focus on is making sure that the faculty also represents those pieces. And then finally, it's also making sure that uh, with the staff and the faculty that we always have this, this, this discussion at the forefront um, so that people feel comfortable and that they're like um, within um, different groups and then also doing the outreach to the different neighborhoods. It's not always gonna be the same parents that always come here. It's gonna be reaching out and making sure that we're listening to all the diverse parent groups and making sure that we're meeting their needs as well as their students' needs and their kids' needs. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and then to the to the viewers, uh, you are invited to submit questions uh, to us now. Uh, if you go to readunion at marinlwv.org, the next question will be answered by Liz first. And the question is, what sort of relationship do you think the board should have with your labor partner, the Reed District Teachers Association? So that's a very good question. As a board member, you know, our relationship is really with the board and our superintendent. And we primarily set the direction for the district and we identify the structure, the organizational structure, really helping to create a supportive environment for our administration and our staff and our students and our teachers or our parents, and to really ensure accountability of the system at large, as well as providing community leadership and educating you know, the broader community on what the goals of the district are. Um, Really, the first interaction I've had with the labor um, discussions have been at board meetings where, where we've heard from teachers who are representing the RDTA and also just other points of view. And I think it's so valuable for us to hear those points of view because we don't have those one-to-one -one interactions. As a parent, we're very lucky to have those interactions with our teachers, just knowing how outstanding they are and how they're dedicated to our students. But when it comes to board decisions and labor decisions, those are, those are kept, you know, really through the decisions and discussions through our superintendent and, and with the principals. Thank you. Uh, next will be Dan. Yeah, uh, in terms of the relationship, I mean, you, you, as a board member, obviously you're holistic looking at the entire picture. So it's not gonna be a, like Liz was saying, it's not always a direct relationship you're having with the teachers association, but you do have to have a positive one because the direction you're laying, they have to enact. So. It goes back to that inclusion part where you have to include them and get their feedback on different things you're trying to build. So that way, you know, that it's going to fit where we're trying to go. Cause if they buy in, obviously it's going to be a lot easier to implement stuff than us implementing it and then telling them what to do. And obviously it's not the board telling them what to do. It's hey, we came up with this holistic plan, 
goes to superintendent, superintendent gives it to the administrators, and then they enact it with the teachers. So it's still a relationship, and the relationship needs to be a positive one to where you can listen to the opinions they have and hopefully include them in the decision process without having to um, it affect in a negative way, you know, but ultimately it's about getting their opinion since they're the ones on the front line teaching it to make sure it fits in the holistic approach on the policies and procedures that you're setting in for the district. So that way you have great success because if you don't listen to them, then it's just going to fail. I mean, that's not good for anybody. Thank you, Dan. Um, and then the next person would be Charles. Yeah, thanks, Susan. So um, on that, on, as a board member, we are to advise and hold the superintendent accountable. So yes, we don't have direct relationships with uh, the, the union and, the, and within the teachers, but we can set the tone and make recommendations for inclusion. So it means that when we know that things are gonna go sideways earlier on in the pandemic is making sure that we're having meetings all the time with them and making sure that we're airing those pieces out. It, makes, it means that we need to advise the superintendent to seek out the, board, the, the, the teacher's uh, perspective on different things earlier so we can iron those pieces out. It's, makes, it's again, advising the superintendent to ensure that when uh, conversations within the pillars of a school district, the parents and the teachers, seems a little fraught, that we send out a positive message that these are two very important pillars and without them, we cannot be a strong school district and making sure that the, the, that the language and the issues addressed on that is helpful and beneficial for all the parties. We set and advise the superintendent to set that tone. And that's what the board should be doing. And that's what, as a board member, I would hope to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacqueline. This, uh, this question, by the way, was one that was uh, sent in from one of the the viewers that, that is in the audience right now. Uh, Jacqueline, you're the last one to answer this question. Thank you. So while it may not be the role of a board member to mediate between staff and administration, and while we may not agree with everything coming from negotiations, uh, it is important probably now more than ever before uh, to make sure that we find a common ground. Um, it is really important, especially as a board member to promote honest and good conversation. These are our teachers. They are one of our strongest assets in this district. We all know that our children are all benefiting from them. Emotions are extremely high right now. We have parents and teachers, are, everyone is navigating the unknown, the impossible, the unprecedented. Right now, emotions are high. We are stressed, we are anxious. We're depressed, we're happy, we don't know. Every day is different and it really lends itself to some heated conversations. And at the end of the day, we all want the same thing and it's uh, to take care of our kids um, and to be proud of that work product. And so I would say it is very important to promote good communication um, and to know that at the end of the day, our goals truly are aligned. Thank you. Um, the, the next question will be answered by Dan first. Uh, overall, read uh, district students consistently exceed standards in English, English language arts and math on the state's annual standardized tests. However, the district's English language learners and students with disabilities consistently score much lower than their peers in both subjects. How can the district best approach closing these per persistent achievement gaps? Dan? Oh, great question. You know, as a board, you know, obviously they come up with a policy and a procedure to, you know, hopefully enact that, you know, in August, like Liz said, they voted on and passed the, you know, the newest one that they're gonna go down the road with, you know, the next couple of years, that it's important that you know, I know that was included in it from what I saw that that's enacted. Now, obviously, that means that, again, it, they bring back inclusion. You got to bring everyone to the table to have those conversations and see what it's like. You know, I've actually sat on an IEP meeting where you have to come together and find the best practices to help these students be, have a chance at success. They're not the funnest thing to sit in. You know, parents have their idea what they want. Every teacher has their idea what they can do and try to help and come together. So as a board, you got to listen to all those stakeholders, take back that feedback 
and then come up with a, a plan that uses obviously statistical data in terms of what are things that are helping students that, you know, English is a second language or students with disabilities to help them foster a successful opportunity and have a chance at success. So ultimately it's bringing enough people to the table to get all the information you need to help come up with a, a strong policy that can be enacted and supported. If it be from funding, staffing, and other needs that they might have in those subjects, that's how you, you're gonna help bring that up, but not in a way to where you're excluding people out. You gotta bring more people in at the table so they can have that conversation and understand holistically what is not working right now because obviously the test scores are showing that it's not. Thank you, Charles. Thanks. Um, so as a board member, again, our role is to be advising and keeping the superintendent accountable for what their role is. So in terms of accountability, it would be going back to the superintendent and asking for what these root causes are in the data and the history of what's this cohort uh, is not, why they aren't meeting uh, the needs and also then making it a priority on the agenda. If items aren't agenda eyes, and for those of us who've been working in and Brown Act managed processes is you need to be, have to, things have to be agendaized so you can talk about them in public. And by doing that, we can add that agenda and make sure it continues to be a priority. One of the items I saw at a, at a strategic um, steering committee that we had earlier in the year uh, was that a lot of, of truancy issues were with uh, some of those, those students. So maybe it's asking the community and those probably those students, I'm, I'm assuming have both working parents. Uh, so it's hard to make sure that they get to school. So maybe it's asking the community and finding out ways working with, is, with, obviously there's confidentiality and all the other things, but asking the community to help make sure these students achieve. So it's seeking all different types of opportunities and bringing people to the table. But at the end of the day, you, it's account, holding the superintendent accountable and making sure that it's a priority and that root causes are found in it. That's what the board should be doing and keeping it on the front burner until it's addressed. Thanks. Thank you, Jacqueline. So the role of public education is to prepare students uh, for the future, their future uh, professional and educational accomplishments. It's to help our students fulfill their diverse potential. Um, it's our job as a board to make decisions to guide and support the district so that we can cultivate an atmosphere that fo fosters inclusivity. Um, and so that we're able to benefit from the diversity that exists in our district. Right now, navigating um, through COVID and um, how we're gonna get back on campus and the number of options and emails and communications that are coming from the district have highlighted these families um, where English is a second language in their home. Many families that exist in our community, English is not even a second language in their home. They do not speak English. They are getting emails, they cannot translate. And then it's hard enough for, for me receiving emails from three schools to make sense of it all and know where I'm supposed to be. It is nearly impossible for a family who doesn't speak the language. So I would say a great goal for us is to build that communication and connectivity and to identify those families, know they're there, reach out, figure out what help they need and to draw those bridges. And that's a silver lining of where we are right now is that it's highlighting that conversation. Thank you, Liz. So I think yeah, my fellow trustees, or board of candidates, <laughs> uh, feel the same way as many of our fellow trustees do, in that we very much, you know, our, our vision for our school is to ensure the success of every student. And I, too, attended the, um, the Strategic Planning Commission uh, meeting that Chuck was at, and we were able to review the numbers from last year and identify areas where students that were English as a second language students and low income students were actually falling behind and the truancy issue. And it's important to recognize that we just completed as a board the learning control and accountability plan, which has actually been changed to learning continuity and attendance plan for the COVID era. And it is throughout that we are building in ways that we need to reach out to students that are not being hurt, that are not connecting online, that are not able to have the resources to be on Zoom all day because they either don't have connectivity, which we've reached out to, or their parents are not able to navigate that because they're working or trying to navigate their lives. And so it's very important that we continue to reach out to those students and bring them in to in-person learning because that's the most equitable place for all of our students to be is in the classroom where we can focus on those students that we're not necessarily hearing from and we can reach out to them. Thank you. Um, 
Charles will be answering the next question uh, first. This is a, another one from the audience. Um, would you support allowing kids whose families chose to stay at home at this stage to participate in Zoom lessons with their class? And Charles is the first to respond. Great question. Um, and yeah, that's a, a, with this hybrid model that we're moving to and some parents, and I, I mentioned earlier, are a little reluctant to, uh, for various reasons, uh, whether it, it, to, to have their kids go to in-person learning. It's also a super challenge if you've got multiple kids and trying to do the logistics. Um, and I would support trying to find a solution to that. Um, there's a lot of schools that have done that already using technology. So maybe it's and we have a, very many wise people live in the community, but it's also using the technology from the foundation, which is a, it is a, it's a big budget of making sure how we can bring connectivity and maybe bringing cameras or something called owl cameras, actually, which you can, I mean, I'm getting into the weeds, which actually a board member shouldn't be doing, but I would advise the superintendent to investigate technologies like owl to look at how they can install those at, at the classroom so that the kids that want to be live can be there and that the kids who, for whatever reasons, can't make it can be remote, um, ensuring that everyone feels safe and secure, but yet they're getting the learning and staying with their same teacher. That's really important, particularly like in the younger kids. And actually, in the, as I've seen my son with his middle school cohort, it's, it's keeping those established, those relationships. And even though you might be remote, it's still that you're still there in the classroom. So that's what I would advise the superintendent uh, and her staff to pursue. Thank you. Uh, the next is Jacqueline. Thank you. So this is a, a hot question. A lot of districts are doing it um, where you're able to um, zoom in to your classroom when you're at home um, and be in your classroom when you're in. Um, our district's not doing it. Um, part of our job as a board member is to lean in to the guidance and the advice of our experts, our teachers, our administration, our superintendent, and lean into them uh, who have the background uh, and the knowledge to be able to guide us on some of these academics um, and curriculum decisions. Um, they have been very strong in um, in stating that they do not find it beneficial, they find it detrimental, they find it distracting. Um, for the teacher and for the students. Um, They're making these decisions in benefit of both communities. So I would lean into that. I would support that decision not to Zoom from the classroom. That being said, as we can tell from the constant communication coming from the district, this is fluid. Every day is different. Um, a couple of days ago, we had two choices of curriculum. Now we have four. You know, I mean, it's. Um, Maybe. So, I mean, we there's constantly decisions changing. It's constantly evolving. So maybe this is something that at some point our teachers would recommend otherwise. But for now, I would support that teacher recommendation. Oh, yeah, Jill. All right, Liz or, okay, sorry. Oh, sorry, Liz, <laughs> right. <laughs> Jill is the one who's sending me the questions from the audience. Um, this is a very challenging issue right now. And I think the reason we're speaking to it is because it's a hot topic. And the, the, right now what we have on the table is three options for learning for students. And you, know, you can follow the phased approach that has been approved by Marin Public Health and our teachers and our board through all of the negotiations that happened over the summer. And that is the most safe plan that we have established by following the Marin Health guidelines. We've also offered an extended distance learning program for students who are not able to come back to the classroom for health reasons, for their family or their personal reasons. And they're in a locked in program that is dedicated to those students. And there's been, a, there's been discussion about now, if we're going back to the hybrid, how do we ensure that we all feel safe? And the data supports that we are in a safe time or in public health has put us in a safe tier, but I understand and I empathize with that uncertainty. As a board, we have created the guidelines and the direction. We've set the continuity of education plan. And part of that plan is to ensure that all students receive the same, that receive all of the academic excellence and social emotional learning that's the same, no matter where the learning is happening. And that is something that we need to enforce. But under the circumstances of dividing classrooms and having 
students zoom in, when the teacher now has to wear a mask, it's not an equitable solution to have some zoom in, to have some in class. And that's why teachers and the superintendent have not put that option on the table. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's another great question. Uh, Liz, I love the word, you know, it's all about equity. You know, ultimately to like support something, you gotta make sure it's gonna work. You know, I think the thought process of it with technology that is it possible? Yes. Is it the most equitable and the best for inclusion? Maybe not. You know, ultimately, when you have, you have to look at the data, and I think the, the direction the board went was appropriate because, you know, based on the information they had, they couldn't find that to be an equitable way to, you know, teach all kids, knowing that the teachers have to wear a mask, not sharing how the teacher could then monitor the kids in class and those that are attending on Zoom at the same time. Unless you have support and help, and there's two teachers in the room or a teacher and other staff member that one could monitor the Zoom and answer questions at any time, and then the teacher can handle those in class. I mean, is that uh, an option that's viable? Yes. Is it realistic with our budgets and everything the way it is? Probably not. So I think when you look at it that way, it's, I think it's a great idea. I would hope that the board looked into it and invested, hey, is this an option? Is this something that we can propose? It sounded like they did. So ultimately, you know, I would back the board in that decision knowing the information they had. Now, does that mean they can't revisit that and circle back to it in the future? They possibly could, because maybe with technology or some other things, maybe more support, we could make it a viable option, but it's not one right now. So, you know, I support that piece of it, making sure that, you know, we were educated on that process and hopefully with all the information, we made the right choice. Because again, it's about inclusion and equity and you want that to be fair and, and, and to be an excellent process for all the students to, to get educated and get the education they deserve. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be answered by Jacqueline first, and, and it is another one coming from the audience. Are you committed to a yearly survey of families, students, graduates, faculty, and staff about what they see as major strengths and shortcomings of the district and the schools? Are you committed to publicly sharing those results? Jacqueline? Uh, yes, the, um, the, I sit on together um, with um, you know, some of my um, fellow candidates here of um, communications committee. And that's one thing we're trying to do better at. Um, it's another thing that in this uh, time of um, crises is a silver lining, and that is that we need to get better with our communication, and we're doing it. Um, we had a communications uh, committee that I believe was started by our um, former trustee, Dana Steele, um, that went dormant for a little while. Uh, a couple years ago, I was lucky enough to get pulled into it. Um, Liz has revived it, and um, we're back up and running. And one of those topics uh, just at our very last meeting was community surveys um, and what we do with them and uh, how we distribute the information so that we can more um, collectively and collaboratively work together. Um, that's what's going to make us better. And I think polling from all of those um, audience members, all of those community members that are vested in this district uh, would help us to uh, reach farther and do better work. So yes. Thank you, Jill. I <laughs> dare I do it again. I'm sorry, Liz. <laughs> it's your turn. <laughs> So thank you, Jacqueline. You said that very eloquently. We are um, on, have started the communications committee, revived it, uh, especially now because it's so important during this time of change. And much of that does rely on gathering feedback from all of our constituents, from and current and former uh, members of the community uh, who have graduated and have moved on. I think it's fabulous to be able to incorporate that feedback and to share it. I am a data analyst. I spend my life doing surveys, quantitative data. If you give that to me, I. I am so appreciative and I feel so confident that we're making the right decisions when we have that data. So I absolutely support surveys, quantitative and qualitative. Any feedback that we can get in any means is very, very valuable. And I think that it's important for all of us to partake in that and for the board to be able to discuss it and understand what the themes are that come out of that research and really be able to influence that direction if we feel that there's a need that needs to be changed. So I highly value that data and support running those types of surveys. And our superintendent is launching surveys, but I think there's opportunity to do more. And as Jacqueline mentioned, we'll bring that to um, the communications committee and continue with that. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Dan. 
Well, I think that was like a loaded question. It would be yes, 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 and yes. I mean, <laughs> the more, again, if we're talking about diversity and inclusion, inclusion means bringing more people in. More information is not a bad thing. What you do with it is the problem. And sharing that information, I don't know how that hurts. You know, the more information you get and from surveys or any other model of way of collecting the information and then be able to analyze it so you have themes, topics, uh, stuff to maybe look at, maybe invest more in, maybe realize that you're not doing enough in it or you're doing too much in it is not a bad thing. That's a great thing to make sure that you're hearing what's going on in the community, what people think of it would be teachers, students, parents, staff, boosters, whoever else is involved. So that way you can take that and have that conversation. And it should be open to anyone that wants to see it. You should be able to share it. If it be, as long as you're following the Brown Act, obviously, that if it has to be an agenda item, put it on the agenda item so you can release it. So everyone can see what those things are. So they understand like, oh, okay, it's all about educating. Sometimes you gotta educate people that don't know what they don't know. This is the data we were getting from the surveys. And that's why we went that direction. And people might be like, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, cause they don't know. So ultimately, yes, 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 and yes. Thank you, Dan. Charles? Um, yeah, and another yes. Um, so, so on that, um, yeah, collecting the data is, is critically important. I think yearly is not frequent enough. Uh, one of the things that I started speaking about on the school board meetings, it's also on my website, it's something that I put first and foremost, is transparency and getting data and surveys about how we're doing and how the school district is doing. So it is, it's asking families and it's understanding those families and getting um, uh, sectional data so you understand the, the different families and, and, and of whether they're single parents, they're both working parents and understanding the needs that we're meeting of those communities. It's also asking those families when they leave the school district and finding out like, oh, you left the school district and finding out it might be a smaller segment, but also understanding like, why did you leave? So it might be more kind of qualitative data than quantitative data, but it's asking them those ed and information. Um, and then doing it on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an annual basis, I don't think it's frequent enough. I think it's doing it on a quarterly basis or a trimester basis. So it meets with the trimesters, but it's making sure that we're meeting all the needs of all the different students, the different parents and the community. And I think one of the things that we should also be asking is the community. Like, how's the Reed Union School District doing for the community? Do you just only know about the Reed Union School District because you, you know, you, you're racing down Tiburon Boulevard and you can't get out? Or you really want to know what's going on with the community? And I think it's really important as the pivotal part of the community in Tiburon Belvedere and Corte Madera is for us to communicate that out and be totally transparent on it. So great question. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question uh, for Liz starting uh, is what do you see as the top two or three more most pressing priorities for the district over the next few years? So the most important priority is reopening our schools safely and we can recognize that that's what we need to address now and getting through, you know, really that plan um, and it helps us prioritize academic excellence and social emotional learning. We, we, it's very, you know, again, it's not easy to see all of the students if they're not in the classroom. So the more we take the proper steps to get us there, that is really the most important uh, priority right now. And then I think we need to continue to follow our strategic plan and follow the, you know, the objectives of the strategic plan. The first is to prioritize academic excellence and the rigor that we had prior to COVID. And then following up with personal development with our students and really bringing in equity and inclusion and the learnings that we have gathered throughout this year and, and many years of not recognizing those inequities necessarily or providing more uh, professional development to to help support that in the learning in the classroom. And those I would say are the, you know, as you say over the next few years, so going through the strategic plan, you know, looking at our at just staff development and continuing to grow the, the, right now we're focused on technology development. And I think that's very important. I'm hopeful that a lot of the learnings that we've had through distance learning and technology will continue once we go fully in person. There's been some outstanding programs that have been used to keep teachers and parents inform together and keep students on track. So I'm hopeful to see those continue as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, next would be Dan. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a lot of a question in the sense, obviously we're in a pandemic. So number one first, you know, everyone wants to get back kids into school. You know, but I think ultimately, you know, barring that piece of it, you know, they have a strategic plan they just voted on and passed in August, you know, and they need to see where that goes. But I think ultimately that, that comes back to a couple of things. You know, the number one thing is going to be diversity and inclusion. And that's because if you look at raising the test scores for those that English is the second language and the students with disabilities, 
you're looking at retaining and hiring a, an amazing staff that meets diversity and inclusion in the sense that they're a diverse group that can bring more people together. You know, when you have those two parts, then that's going to lead to that academic excellence that I've seen so far since I've been here. And I hope it continues to grow. And the last piece is always incorporating technology when it's appropriate and helpful to help keeping that amazing education that my kids are getting, at least that I feel. And I hope the rest of the parents feel that their students are getting or their kids are getting that as well, keeps growing and keeps getting better and better and better. So, I mean, ultimately, you know, if you take the pandemic aside and getting kids back into school, it's retaining and keeping the great teachers that we have, making sure that, you know, we can improve in the diversity and inclusion and helping those with English as a second language and those with disabilities so we can raise them and have them be more successful than they are or that our test scores are they showing and to make sure that we can keep providing the amazing education that our kids are getting. Uh, thank you. Next is Charles. Great, thanks. Uh, so yeah, first thing is, uh, the first priority is rebounding uh, from the pandemic. I'm, uh, I'm assuming we'll play, we'll be able to, to get through this piece and I hope 2021 will be a successful time. It is ba based on that and going through is then revisiting the strategic plan and seeing what has been pushed to future years because of our spending a lot of time on, on the COVID response and making sure that we're not missing those and also reprioritizing those. I think if we don't strategically think about looking at the strategic plan and reordering any priorities based on our experience that we're going through now, I think we're missing a great learning opportunity. And then one of the other critical priorities that we need to have is reestablishing the trust between the faculty, the administration, and the parents. I think unfortunately during the, this pandemic, a lot of that's been frayed a little bit. I'm not, I'm, I, and it's, I think it's being, creating a community and bringing it together and, and addressing that within that. And then finally it is on, and, and Dan mentioned it, you guys have also, all of you have mentioned it, is on technology that with, once we've got played through the, the, that once we get through the pandemic and we're able to do these things is looking at the different technologies that we're using at Reed, at Del Mar and at Bel Air and seeing how we can upgrade those based on our learnings, what we're doing now. Because this is, while it's, it's, it's awful, if we can learn from this and make be stronger and better and more resilient, I think we'll be a great school district. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline. Thank you. Uh, so one, I, I would, um, I have to start with um, navigating the current pandemic um, and obviously continuing to digest um, information that's coming out to us daily. Um, and navigating a safe return to campus. Um, that's obviously the most pressing priority. Beyond that, looking forward over the next few years, I would say second, um, that COVID has highlighted a need for better communication between the district and parents. And as Chuck just mentioned, reinstilling trust and community investment. We have that. We've lost it along the way, but we have it and we can bring it back. Um, we all have the same goal of prioritizing education and taking care of our kids. Um, anxiety and, and emotions are high right now and it's easy to forget that. Um, but we really, if we have nothing else, we have community investment. Um, and so it's returning to that. And third, um, through communication, we need to highlight um, equity and inclusion. Um, that is where my heart has rest for several years. Um, we need to bring awareness to the topic. We need to make sure that people know that we have community members that live right next door to us who need our support and our advocacy. And we have to find solutions so that all of our students have equal access. Thank you. Uh, the, I would like to remind the um, viewing audience that you can still submit um, a question by going to read our reunion at marinlwv.org. And the, the um, next question um, is recently people, and it will be answered by Dan first. Um, uh, recently, uh, the police opened an investigation into social media accounts associated with Redwood High School uh, circulating an, an anti-Semitic content. Uh, Tiburon has dealt with its own inc incidents of anti-Semitism in recent years, culminating in a march against, uh, against anti-Semitism through the downtown in late uh, 2018. What strategies would you recommend to educate students uh, around hate speech 
and the danger of cyber cyber bullying? Another good question. Uh, you know, I think all the candidates have talked about, you know, diversity inclusion, how important that is, you know, and I think that's the center of this, this piece, because when you talk about inclusion, you're asking about fairness and, and respect. And you have to be able to teach that, you know, they talk about the emotional uh, teachings that they do it, you know, in the reschool district, you know, that when I was growing up and going through the education program, becoming a teacher, they didn't really touch on that. And now it's something that's at the forefront. You know, I think that's definitely one way. But again, it's all about education. You got to make sure it's not just educating the students, it's educating the students and giving uh, things to parents that can help them continue that education at home and have those conversations with their kids so they understand some of the dangers of cyberbullying, racism, and how inclusion and diversity really works. You know, that's the biggest thing. And obviously bringing opportunities to bring people together and have those conversations. You know, unfortunately, the school is one of those places that can do that. Um, sometimes they might not want to, but it's a great place to at different school events that you bring people together and have those conversations and try to keep building on it, making it better. You know, that's horrible what happened, you know, with the anti-Semitic uh, marks that were happening at Redwood High School. And, and that should not happen to any student. You know, unfortunately, our society is, you know, there are people like that out there. So, you know, the best way to combat it is obviously take a strong stance, a zero tolerance policy on it, but then educate everyone on diversity and inclusion and what that really means and bringing people together and giving tools to parents to have and continue that conversation when they're not at school and providing the tools and, and resources needed to the staff teachers, administrators to continue that. And that's where it should be. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, uh, yeah great question. I'm glad it, it got addressed or got brought up. So I think um, Redwood didn't do it as, as aggressively as I wish they had, but uh, when something happened here, it was two years ago, I think the school district did a great job addressing it very quickly and making sure that this is not tolerated in our community and also engaging with different members of the Jewish community to bring them forward and to bring, have a discussion on this. And I thought that was, that was well done. And I think that it, so kudos to the school districts for addressing that, for continuing to do that. It is education and conversations at age appropriate levels across all the different schools. So it's making sure that like in the middle schools, I mean, I would think that in some, one of the classes it's appropriate that this is a topic about talking about cyberbullying and about anti-Semitism and how, and, and its roots and where it came from. I mean, it, 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 you can use current activities uh, right now that's going on in our country about people and the language that they use. And, it, and again, it's addressing it in an age appropriate way and having the conversation and giving parents that language to do that. Again, I think that the faculty is ready to go on these pieces. I think they're well-trained um, and very eager to, to share their knowledge and build that trust. Again, again with Reed at, at Bel Air, and also at Del Mar. And I think, again, it's just making sure that the board gives the superintendent that support, that this is what we want as a priority and that anti-Semitism and cyberbullying is not to be tolerated in the school district. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline? Thank you. So just before this forum, I participated and listened in on a forum sponsored by the Marin County Office of Education, um, where they had, um, community speakers uh, speaking directly on this topic of anti-Semitism. Um, awareness and conversation is absolutely the first step in confronting um, anti-Semitism, racism, cyberbullying. We have to draw attention to it. We have to call it out for what it is. Um, it would We would be remiss and, and fail if we did not. Um, the way to keep anti-Semitism and racism at bay is to foster trust, community, and morality in our schools and our city and our county, uh, the greater community. Um, specifically in response to the rise in anti-Semitism that we're seeing honestly everywhere, um, we can consider materials and programs that have already been developed by places like uh, Skirball, the Anti-Defamation League, um, other tolerance-based organizations. Uh, we have, um, uh, look to local leaders at Kol Shofar and Road of Shalom to help guide that conversation. Uh, we've done that in our own community. Um, what about simply starting with making sure that our own school district calendar is set after taking into consideration the holidays of religious groups? Um, there is a lot more to say on the topic, but bringing awareness and conversation would be a great place to start. And that's where we are right now. Thank you. Uh, Liz. I agree with the sentiments of all of my fellow, my 
candidates. I keep wanting to call you trustees. Um, I do think that we need to raise awareness and have the conversation. We've experienced anti-Semitism on our campus, on Bel Air's campus, and we have experienced it within our community and district, uh, Mount Tam, uh, as well. And I feel that it's so important that we have the conversation and address it, that it is within our boundaries. And we have to, as a, as a as a school board, it's very helpful to be able to attend uh, sessions like the Marin Office of Education provides, um, the, the California Department of Education, the CSBA, there's so much information out there on what we can be doing and how we can educate ourselves and educate our, our faculty um, with tools to help bring those conversations to our students and to be able to discuss it as a district. So I agree that we need to raise awareness. We need to not be afraid of the conversation and recognize that it is around us. It is within our it's within our border. And also cyberbullying. Now, right now we're in a, in a phase where technology is just ever present. Our kids are on digital screens all the time and it is almost impossible to avoid cyberbullying. And so for being able to educate students on how to recognize it, knowing what it, what it is and giving them the power to speak out against it is so important. And I know our schools are doing that. It's just now more than ever, we need to focus on, on those issues that they're faced with. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the next question will be answered by Charles first. And uh, this question is about uh, the foundation. Uh, communication was recently received from the foundation for Reed Schools, uh, indicating that if the foundation doesn't meet its fundraising goals, there will be teacher layoffs and cuts in the budget next year. Assuming the foundation does not meet its goals, how would you prioritize cuts to the district? Oh, a softball question. <laughs> uh, great question. Uh, and then it's going to be a reality, I, I believe. There's, there's two. One is, is, is the trying times of the recession that we're going through. Um, and also the school district is getting a little bit smaller. So the expectation is that that budget will be getting smaller, unfortunately. So I think first thing is, is if there's a shortfall, I would look and see if there's other areas that we can through grants and other means to avoid that. So that's first and foremost what I would do. So I, 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 I challenge the premise that I have to make that decision. I would also look to see if there's any ways to augment and support that so that we don't need to make those cuts because that's a hard thing to do. Uh, I would then advise the superintendent that we need to start looking at the different faculty and go to, and, and, and again, open transparent discussion with the, the teachers to figure out, hey, here's the situation. So if we can't find additional funds. Here's the situation that we need to close this budget gap and that we're going to need a reduction um, of this many faculty and work with them to identify maybe there's some faculty that are near retirement. And they're like, yeah, okay, I'll take, a, I'll take an early retirement um, because it, we just wanna make sure that it's an open and transparent discussion with them to help make that happen. It's a very difficult situation. So, but that's what I would do first because I wouldn't wanna make some cuts in like art or just in, in the design lab. I think it's looking at seeing what the faculty can provide so that we don't have to make some kind of draconian or or not based in a good thoughtful discussion cuts. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. So we are very fortunate to live where we live. Um, these many public school districts in our state have already had to face this conversation um, in this current year um, and, and for next year. Um, I am so hopeful and so optimistic um, that we will come together. Um, if there is ever time to support our community financially, it is right now if we want to continue to enjoy the programming we uh, currently have. Um, we're lucky that funding for our school district comes from local property taxes. We're a community funded school. Um, that being said, we're also very lucky to have the foundation that supplements our school district budget. I really hope that we are not in a situation this spring where we are um, negotiating budget cuts, um, but we also need to be realistic that that might be the situation we are in. Um, and so I think we would, I would lean into our, um, our superintendent uh, to guide us in that conversation. Um, I think um, to be transparent, uh, we are very lucky to have a Spanish program at Reed School. Um, I think there would be a question as to whether that Spanish program would continue to exist um, in an area where we needed to make budget cuts. 
Thank you. Uh, Liz. This is the hardest decision. We do not want to lose our teachers. You know, we want to do everything we can to maintain the integrity of our outstanding staff. And we, this is, you know, to be faced with this issue, which other districts have been faced with, it would be, de would be devastating. We don't want to lose any teachers. We are faced with lower enrollment and the COVID pandemic has been very expensive and it, or will, it hasn't yet, but it will be, you know, and you think about that and we need to be able to increase, you know, the ability to, and influence our parents to donate to the foundation because it's not easy. It's a hard time, but we do everything we can to keep our teachers. And in the spring, we offered an early retirement plan, as Chuck was mentioning earlier, to to actually get ahead of it and try and and you know try to forecast uh, lower enrollment. Let's see if there's opportunities where we can um, enable teachers to retire early and give them incentive to do so if they are in that position. So we aren't faced with cutting our teachers or cutting our programs or anything that really takes away from the learning of our students and our outstanding uh, services that we provide to our, to our students. So I, I don't wanna be faced with that issue, but I think our, my fellow candidates have mentioned that this is very much that would come to the superintendents uh, decision authority and that we would need to to review what those decisions are. Thank you. Dan. Man, you guys are crushing the questions today. Uh, you know, <laughs> working in, in higher ed, I, I've been dealing with this. I won't lie. I had to take a pay cut this year because of the current economic status and I'm still facing furloughs. Then the eye that that's still a potential for me and, and, and where I work. So, you know, it, it's a conversation that's going to be have to be had. It's not one you want. Like I said, the foundation here is amazing. I have been, and I've worked in a couple of districts and I've lived in some others. Obviously my kids went to a different one before we came here. No one is raising that amount of money in any foundation. I don't even know some universities that can't raise that amount of money. So, you know, they do an amazing job. You like, you know, Jacqueline said, and everyone else, you hope that they can maintain that, but it's understandable in the current uh, economy. And I think Charles hit it on the head when he said, look at other options first. Are there other grants? and other funding revenues that we potentially could tap into that could help stave off this, you know, potential, you know, budget cuts and or, you know, reduction in staff. Cause that's obviously the last thing you want to do because your staff or teachers specifically are the ones that help us maintain this amazing education that our kids are getting. So unfortunately, if it gets to that, you kind of have to lean in on like Jacqueline and Liz said on the superintendent that hopefully that everyone's come to the table, talked about this is the reality this is how much we have to cut or whatever the percentage is. And they can have those conversations to find the best avenue to have it minimize the impact on our kids as much as possible. I mean, that's the number one goal. You want to minimize that and not sacrifice anyone. So, you know, hopefully we don't come to that, but uh, unfortunately that might be our reality. Okay. Uh, the next question, which will uh, possibly be the last question uh, that we'll have is one from uh, the viewing audience and will be answered by Jacqueline first uh, is uh, as a board member, you receive feedback from a wide array of constituents, often with significantly different differing views. As a board member, how would you aggregate these views, reconcile the differences to adopt, uh, adopt a cohesive strategy plan for the district? And uh, Jacqueline goes first. Um, what difference of opinion? What is that? Does uh, that really I think no, it's just weird. kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Yes, that would be the role of, of a board member, would be to be an ear to all those difference of opinions and be able to draw them all in together. Um, you're going to experience that um, if I'm fortunate enough to be able to serve this community as a trustee, I will likely experience that even among my own board, um, the community, the parent body, um, and the role of a trustee is to operate collaboratively um, with community and fellow fellow trustees um, and to be able to come together in decision. I um, hate to sound repetitive, but I'm just going to say it again. It's about communication um, and being open and honest um, and bringing those opinions together and being an ear. Um, I promise to have an open ear um, and to always listen. That would be my primary goal um, and objective to serve you um, and, and to hear um, all, all opinions, um, especially the ones um, that are contrary to my own. 
um, and to be able to bring those together and to find resolution. Thank you. Uh, Liz. So when you join the board, one thing that we do is uh, take master's in governance courses to really understand what the roles are of the board. And what we all learn is that we have a shared unity of purpose. We all are on the same, have the same mindset to support the success of all of our students. And when you have that shared unity of purpose, you're all able to really kind of work together with that primary moral imperative, which is to, you know, raise the bar and close the gap for students and to really pro provide the right systems in place to help our educators do that. And often there will be issues that come to the table where there are differing opinions, especially in times of crisis, which we have been faced with now, which has raised a lot of differences of opinion and how we're going to approach this. And it's very important to have our board meetings and be able, be able to listen to the collective decision making of our, of our fellow trustees and to be able to hear the questions so that we can formulate the right decisions together as a group. And it's okay if we disagree on, on certain topics. It, it's actually, you know, we want to have a uni united voice, but if we are thinking about all of the students and if if we are, you know, there's some some decisions where we've we've had to have a split vote of three to two, and it's very hard to have those decisions. We'd rather have a unanimous vote, but sometimes we don't, and it's very important to have those conversations and to be very thoughtful in the decision making, knowing the perspective of our fellow board members. And we're all again with that shared unity of purpose to support the success of all of our students in our district. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, um, another great question. I don't think any of us here, I don't wanna speak for the, my other candidates, but I don't think any of us are here to push our own agenda. I mean, you're doing it because you're, support, you're supporting the community, but you're the voice for the community. I'm not, I mean, yeah, I'm doing this because my kids are in the district, but I'm not doing it for my kids per se. I'm doing it for all the kids in the district. And I think everyone has that same voice. You know, ultimately, if you don't educate yourself on, on getting feedback from the community in terms of what, you know, they feel needs to be improved or not improved or what's going great, and you're not really doing their job. I and mean, the job is to represent them and then bring that back to the board and, and having an open, honest conversation about it is. And like Liz said, sometimes they agree and that's awesome. Sometimes they don't and that's okay. I mean, cause at least they brought that point of view so then they all can see that and then vote their conscience. Like, you know what? You brought up a very valid point but I still think this is the right direction to go. So we need to do that. And I think the board as a whole has done a great job of getting behind each other once they make that decision and move forward. So, you know, you have to take in the voices of everyone and disseminate it so you can give it back to the rest of the board because maybe they didn't hear about you know how one group is feeling or another group is feeling so that way they can hear that too and, and helps them form their decision when it comes time to vote you know that's why we're all passionate about you know getting involved in this because it's not like you know you do it as a volunteer you're doing it because you want to do it and if you're not doing it for that purpose and to help the kids then this is definitely not the thing to be doing then thank you charles yeah so thanks so in, part of it is I'm going to, to, to question on some of the premises, making sure that we've gotten all the information from all the different stakeholders. Sometimes there are stakeholders that may hold back and may not feel comfortable sharing their perspective. So I think as a board, we have to bend over backwards to ensure that we're talking and being available to all the different constituents who want their voices heard. Uh, I think we've kind of are seeing that right now in this kind of like potential fourth different model because there's some some parents are like oh wait a minute this is not what i want to be doing and they have felt intimidated by some other folks in the community that they couldn't speak forward so i think as a board member we have to bend over backwards to make sure that we're hearing all of those voices with the goal and everyone's mentioned this but it's at the, the our intention is for the best of the students so it's again being incredibly transparent in that process and then what we've heard from the different constituents and what we believe is in the best interest of the students. And again, being very transparent on that. I think what's one of the best things about, well, there's not many best things about COVID uh, other than the traffic reduction, but it's also these types of meetings have made them more accessible for more people to be involved in the process. And I think that's been critical. So I think it's really making sure that we've done all that and done out, make sure that we've gotten all, received all the information on the communication and communicating effectively with what the decision is and being completely transparent with that, with again, the focus is on the betterment of the students. That's the goal of what a board trustee should be doing. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, you, you really got into uh, the, the range of issues that we had there. Uh, this concludes the question portion of the forum. But before the candidates make the closing statements, I'd like to share some key differences with how our elections will be done this year 
uh, particularly with, with regard to how and when you can vote. As you know, November 3rd is election day. You have until October 19th uh, to register to vote. And if you want to register after that date, you need to go to the elections office in the Civic Center uh, to register and to vote. Uh, slide three, please. Uh, vote by mail ballots will be mailed on October 5th. 5th. All active registered voters in Marin County will automatically receive a ballot in the mail. There's no need to request one. You can start voting by mail on October 6th by dropping off your ballot either uh, at one of the 12 secure drop boxes located around the county uh, by the elections department at the elections office in the civic center or at the post office. The mail postage is, is paid. Uh, so you just need to drop it off at a post office box. To be counted, returned ballots must be postmarked no later than November 3rd and received at the elections office no later than November 20th. Please note that Marin County pays postage for all returned ballots. For in-person voting, the polling places will be open for four days from October 31st through November 3rd. There will be 29 consolidated polling places and your ballot will indicate which one you are assigned to. You can vote at the Elections Department at the Civic Center starting on October 6th during regular business hours. For more information about Dropbox and polling locations, go to www.marinvotes.org. Thank you. Uh, and at the end of this forum, there will be a slide uh, listing several additional websites. We recommend that you check that you check them out for more details about election information. Now the candidates will make their closing statements of one minute, and we'll start uh, with Liz and go in the reverse order. Liz, thank you. And thank you so much for that information, Susan. Uh, my priority is to act in the best interest of all of our students and to listen to the needs of our parents and educators and our community members, just to ensure that I make the best decisions for our district. I believe now more than ever, we need stability and collaboration and adaptability. And as we navigate these uncertain times, I am here dedicated to serve you and our community. And I'm hopeful that you will elect me to continue to do so for the next four years. Also, if you need more information, I do have a website, which is lizwebforrusd.com. And that's number four, rusd.com. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline. Unmute. There. Got it. <laughs> thank you. I wanna thank my fellow candidates. I'm humbled to share this experience with you. I take great pride in our community. I love being involved in our schools, building relationships in our neighborhood and supporting our families. I understand the role of a trustee. We have work to do. We have inequities to tackle, relationships to mend. We are incredible and we are raising incredible children and we can do this together. I would be honored to listen and serve you as together we raise America's next greatest generation. And I um, do too have a website, uh, jj4schoolboard.org, um, and I'm open to any conversation or questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Charles? Yeah, thank you again for hosting this. And again, thanks to all the fellow candidates that have been on this. I hope it's been beneficial for people who are listening or who will listen in the future about our differences, about how we would approach uh, some of the challenges uh, that are faced now at the Reed Union School District, as well as in the future. Um, I'd also like to just say that my, I'm in this because I wanna be here for the next four years supporting the Reed Union School District. So my plan is even though my son would graduate into high school, this is four years, I'm here for it. And then also in terms of getting feedback from other schools, 
or from the different schools is making sure and talking to the PTA and also using other mechanisms to get feedback from Del from Bel Air and from Reed. I've already set up on my website, chuckhornbrook.com, mechanisms for people in the community to reach out to me now. And those will continue to be up there uh, in the future. Thanks again. I hope I can earn your vote. Thank you, Dan. Well, from first to last, uh, again, thanks everyone, you know, for hosting this League of Women Voters and the other candidates. You guys are amazing, and I won't lie. You know, for me, I'm, I'm the new member of the community. I haven't been around for as long as these three have. Uh, you know, for me, I just wanted to try to help out because I know I could. You know, my biggest things were just helping retain, recruit highly qualified teachers, you know, developing supporting academic initiatives that will keep preparing our kids for this amazing education that they're getting and read school district that I think some people forget, you know. Uh, as a trustee, you know, I'd work to make sure taxpayer dollars are spent and foundation dollars are spent wisely and, and to benefit the students in the classroom, uh, especially helping those with special needs or English language learners, making sure we include diversity and inclusion into uh, everything that we're doing and seeing what else we can do to help continue moving forward as we, you know, travel through this pandemic, luckily us, and as we move forward to the next four years, as we implement the new strategic plan that the board has voted on in August that, you know, we, we are excited or they're excited at least, I'm excited to see it, uh, to them implement. So thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes our forum tonight. Thank you to the ARC newspaper for hosting this event. Thanks to the candidates for your involvement and uh, participation. Thank you to Linda Sula for timekeeping and Jill Sampson, Greg Brockbank as question sorters, Nancy Bell and Anne Wakeley for uh, technical support. And a special thanks to CMCM TV. We could not have done this without them, believe me. <laughs> a video of tonight's forum will be posted on the league's website in the next few days. Slide five, please. Uh, for more information about the election, the candidates, and ballot measures, visit the League's website at www.marinlwv.org and click on Viewers Voters Edge logo. There are some additional recommended websites on that site, too. And again, thank you for joining us tonight, and most importantly, for voting. <laughs>